sweet. Okay, so we did good. All right, back to announcements. Uh, just a reminder that today is our all-church paintball event. So if you are interested, it's still not too late to sign up and go. Um, afterwards, we're just going to meet upstairs, uh, and I'll just kind of go over some details and then just to get a head count. So if you're interested in coming and shooting each other with paintballs, which is a fun time, uh, please, uh, it's not too late to, to sign up and go. So uh, see me after and, or meet upstairs. Uh, next, we have the Heritage Days Parade coming, which means it's August. So uh, Heritage Days Parade is coming up. Uh, if you would like to walk in the parade or if you would like to help decorate the float, um, there is a sign-up sheet in the back. Um, and Louise is, is in charge. So if, you have any, if you have any questions, you can ask her or contact her. Uh, but she would like to know who all is interested in walking or helping with the decorating. Um, also, you can, uh, in your inserts, there's our prayer needs. You can be taking these and just praying for each other, as well as our missionaries are on the back side. So you can just be covering all of these in our prayers. And lastly, I have an update on Pastor Wayne. I talked to Louise this morning, and of course, you know that he had the double hip surgery last week, and he is now home. So this morning, Louise said he's doing well and uh, recovering nicely at home. Uh, they thank you for your prayers. Uh, he's walking well with the walker and getting stronger each day. Uh, however, he's not quite up for visitors yet, but if you want to send a card with an encouraging note, I'm sure that that would be appreciated. So... Um, so Wayne will not be at the paintball today. I was trying to get him to come. I was going to rig up the uh, wheelchair for him with some paintball guns on the side, but uh, he did not, did not go for that. So uh, this morning, for the last few weeks, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on my own life. I'm just really looking at how I'm living my life, looking at my priorities and checking to see where I've been putting God. You know, I've been blessed to be able to go to camps uh, as faculty, and uh, the messages this year have just been really making me think about my priorities and, and really how I'm living my life, because I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So if I'm not guaranteed tomorrow, am I ready? Am I ready to stand before my Heavenly Father? Am I ready? What will He say? Will He say, welcome home? As I was reflecting on my life, I started thinking about the spiritual warfare that we face. And I started to think about temptation and sin, and really reflecting on my own. I'm not perfect. <laughs> Far from it. I face temptation and I mess up and give in to temptation and sin. So often we focus on the sin part. That we don't focus on the temptation that gets us to sin. We tend to just take temptation and, and kind of put it down over here, and we don't take it as serious as we should. Temptation comes to us with filters attached. It takes the sin and it dresses it up to look good. This morning, I'd like to look at how temptation comes and how we can overcome the temptation through the power of Jesus. In today's picture-taking world, there are many apps and programs that can dress up a picture. How many are familiar with Instagram or Snapchat? Right? You've got all kinds of filters. You can put little mustaches on, things like that. It's pretty cool. You can add filters to the picture to make it better, do funny things with it. So I have a few real-life pictures, and you can see the difference the filters make. So here's the before picture. Nice wood kids in the sled. After? No one? Next before? on a barrel, but then you add the filters to it, boom, she's floating in air, look at that, next, you got this baby, this cute, adorable little baby, and I don't know what the dad is doing, but the next, boom, <laughs> baby's floating in air, look at that, it's crazy, all right, next before, you got Superman, right? Anyway, next slide. And there's the after. Look at that. 
I mean, you can't Photoshop a better picture. <laughs> the real Superman right there. <laughs> oh, but you could do some crazy things with Photoshopping pictures, uh, which, which is pretty fun, fun to do. Um, temptation does this too. It dresses sin up and it makes it look better than it is. The first point I like to make is like the first temptation in Garden of Eden, all temptation is deceptive. It offers something good, but only leads to hurt, guilt, and death. Genesis 3, 1 through 8. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, (laughs) Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent told the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Before the serpent approached Eve, her and Adam looked at the fruit, and they remembered what God had told them, and they obeyed. They saw and they knew the consequences And death was not very appealing. Now, I don't know, but there is something about touch it and you will die that is not very attractive. Sorry. Touch it and you will die kind of, that puts the brakes on for me, right? But then enters a serpent. And the first thing he does when he tempts Eve is to get her to doubt God's heart and his plan. The serpent tempted her to believe that God was withholding from her, and she decided to go outside of his plans to gain something for herself. As the serpent was tempting her, she started seeing the fruit differently. It started becoming pleasing to the eye. It looked good, and then she desired the wisdom that it would give her. Both Adam and Eve gave in to the temptation, and they sinned. They allowed Satan to take the fruit, and disguise it as something good and appealing. Just like the poison apple that the wicked witch gave to Snow White, right? Temptation is often disguised as something good and appealing. As I thought about this, I thought of the perfect illustration. How many of you like to fish? I love fishing. I pretty much grew up fishing. Uh, My dad and my grandpa were both fishermen. They both love to fish. So I grew up fishing. Most of my childhood pictures are with, with fish. I think we have some with Santa Claus and, and gifts and, and fish. I don't know. Maybe not. But most of my childhood pictures are with fish. So we spent a lot of time fishing. And one thing about fishing is you don't need a whole lot to catch fish, right? But... First thing you start with is a pole, and you put this little thing on a hook, right? Does that look good? Lauren, you want to bite this, right? Huh? Doesn't this look good? It's so appealing. Look at that, right? You put this hook on, but if you take this hook and you throw it in the water, are you going to catch anything? No. You might snag one here or there, but you're not really going to catch a whole lot of fish just using a hook, right? Because it doesn't look attractive. Fish may not, may not be the smartest, but they're not crazy, right? They look at this thing and they're like, not today, not today. We're not going to, you know, this doesn't look good, especially when you come up and you give it a little touch. Ah, no, sorry, it's not very appealing. It's not very attractive. However, you open up your little tackle box, right? Go out. Huh? What about this, Lauren? Now, this is what's starting to look a little bit better, right? You got something appealing right here. So then you take that. Let's see if I can do this so I hook it myself. 
Usually I let my dad do it. Shh, sometimes. <laughs> now I got my girls that do it, so. So you throw this little bad boy on, and now look. Ah, Lauren. Don't rush on the stage. It's sharp. All right, but now it looks good, right? It's starting to look a little appealing. Now if you take this and you throw this in the water, and this little thing does its magic, and it looks good because it's swimming, tails are flailing, going like this. Now it looks good. Now it's going to catch the fish's eye, right? It's going to look at that thing. Oh, hey, that doesn't look so bad. It looks a little tasty. And I'll come up to it and it'll look at it. Maybe get a little nibble. Be like, oh, yeah. And then, bam, you got it, right? It looks at it. But the worm is covering up the hook. The hook is still there. But now you put that on and it, it looks appealing. It looks good. Now the fish, they don't recognize the hook because they're too focused on the, the worm. They're focused on the lure. And that is why fishermen have a tackle box full of, of, of lures and worms that, that look appealing. Things that rattle, make noise. Things that look shiny, glowing dark. Lauren, that's rough. <laughs> but they got things that, that look good. Things that are appealing to the fish. The fish look at that and say, hmm, I like that color. Or, hey, that looks shiny. I like it. And that's how you catch fish. Easy as that. <laughs> and a lot of patience. <laughs> but a fisherman has a tackle box full of attractive bait to hide the hooks and to make it look good to the fish's eye. Sin is like that hook, right? When you look at sin, it's not very attractive in and of itself, especially when you look at the consequences of that sin. I mean, who wants to be known as a liar? Who wakes up and says, I want to be addicted to pornography, or I'm going to cheat on my spouse so that it destroys my family or my marriage? I don't know of anyone that wakes up and decides that I'm going to have that sin because it looks good. It usually takes one temptation, one sin at a time. You know, Wayne has preached many times about compromises and how all it takes is one small compromise and another compromise and another compromise. And each compromise gets a little easier to make the next compromise and the next compromise. And before you know it, we are walking down the wrong path. And we are walking down those and, and doing things that we shouldn't do and walking away from God. Satan has his own tackle box full of lies and ways to make those small compromises look so good and so appealing. To understand temptation, we must first look at who is doing the tempting. Satan is out to get us. He is real and he is alive. He doesn't care who you are, what your status is. He doesn't care if, you're, if you have Christianity checked on your Facebook page. Satan is out to destroy and lead people away from Christ. He wants to destroy marriages and families, especially if they believe in Jesus. He is going to tempt us to sin, hoping to lead us away from God. We need to be prepared, not just saying with our words that we're ready, but to be disciplined in our heads and in our hearts to recognize when we are being tempted and to go to God for strength to flee. Too often I think we don't take temptation and the sneakiness of Satan serious. And that tips the hand to Satan. I know in my own life when I give in to temptation, I didn't take it serious. And I didn't even try to fight it. I let my humanness take over and give in because it felt good. Or I got something out of it. Not thinking about what it does to, to God or what it does to my own life or the people around me. Satan has a way to make the worst things look good. If you look at sin itself and the consequences of sin, it is not attractive. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 kind of goes through that. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live in this will not inherit the kingdom of God. When we look at this list, there's nothing attractive about those. 
especially when we read verse 21, and it tells us if we live in those sins, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Temptation attempts to make God's commands seem needlessly constricting rather than beautifully protective. God desires to protect us from sin, where temptation compels us to indulge in it. The grass is always greener on the other side, right? Until you get to the other side and you realize that it isn't. Yet we continue to fall for temptation. We continue to allow Satan to sit and tempt us and fill our heads with lies. We continue to live in sin. Which leads me to my second point. Temptation comes from our sinful nature, not from God. James 1, 13 through 17. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. These verses teach us a couple things about temptation. First, God does not tempt us to sin. In fact, God provides us a way out of temptation. In Corinthians 10:13. Second, it isn't a sin to be tempted to sin. It's our response to the temptation that can lead to life or death. It's our response to the temptation. So let me share a personal illustration. In elementary school, I had excellent grades. I loved school. had excellent grades. I worked hard and I enjoyed school. I got picked on a little bit, but I was still focused on, I had great teachers and, and worked on my schoolwork. But then I got into seventh grade. And my grades started to slip, and I started to get picked on more. And then eighth grade, they both got worse, my grades and being picked on. I hated school. I missed a lot of school, faking being sick, and didn't put forth the effort that I needed to. My grades were horrible, and I knew that if my parents got my report cards, that I would be in trouble. So Satan used my fear and started planting thoughts in my head, and I bought it hook, line, and sinker. There were no conferences, so all I had to do was intercept the mail, get rid of the evidence, and they would never know. Woo! Easy peasy. Satan made it sound so simple and parent-proof. But the voice got louder telling me that it would work and I would never get caught. I also came up with many ways to justify it, like blaming the bullies, because if it wasn't for the bullies, I would like school, and I wouldn't be in this problem. You know, I could come up with lots of excuses to justify doing this to myself. But the moment that I started to desire to steal my parents' mail and to lie to them was the moment that I sinned. If I would have said no to the temptation, it would not have been a sin. But the moment I desired it, the moment I started planning it in my head, was the moment that it gave birth to sin. And I went forward on the plan. My mom worked days, my dad worked third shift, so he slept during the day. I had first crack at the mail. So every day I checked the mail, waiting for my report card to show up. Finally it came. So I took it, and I hid it. I crawled under my bunk bed, and I hid it under the carpet. So we had a little piece of carpet there. So I just kind of tucked it right underneath the carpet, under my bunk bed. Who's going to go under there? It's brilliant. No one's going to go under there looking for my report cards. So when asked about it, I lied and said that my report cards never came because they knew I got the mail and brought it in. My report cards never came. And then I lied to them about the grades. First time I did this, I was nervous. Next time, it got a little easier. And the time after that, I got even easier. I wasn't so nervous. I was getting away with it. Or so I thought I was getting away with it. You know, I didn't really realize that parents are actually pretty smart. <laughs> parents are pretty smart. Uh, they called school to check on why my report cards were not being sent home, only to find out that they were. So I was caught, not only stealing their mail, but lying to them. If I would have listened to Satan, if I would have not listened to Satan, and if I would have said no to the temptation, all I had to do was explain my grades to my parents. And I probably would have had a consequence. But I wouldn't deal be dealing with the, 
that consequence on top of the consequence of the sin, of the stealing and the lying. Temptation is a process. It starts with a harmless thought or desire that entices us to do something that we're not supposed to do. Once the thought is planted, we allow it to sit in our heads. We entertain the idea and explore it, contemplating committing that sin, thinking about how parents will never know. And then after entertaining the thought, we allow Satan to continue to make it look good. And then we commit the act of sin to fulfill our craving. We are constantly being bombarded with desires to commit sin. Like Steve was saying, it's all around us. We are being tempted all the time. We are tempted, we are tempted to, on our income taxes to get more money, so we might lie on those. We are tempted to get angry and seek revenge on our en- enemies. You know, when that person cuts you off and when you're driving, you're like, oh, no, I'm not going to allow this to happen. And then you speed up and anyway. That's a whole other sermon. Anyway. <laughs> But we, we allow the, we, our anger to get the best of us. We are tempted to lust after others. The world around us is constantly flooding us with images and lyrics and videos, planting those desires to commit those sins in our heads. We are also very good at justifying or rationalizing uh, committing those sins, right? If I can justify it, then it makes it okay, right? I'm pretty good at justifying. If I could justify it, It's okay. How many of you have ever said the following? Everybody's doing it. No one is perfect. Eh, God will forgive me, so I might as well do it. And my favorite one, I didn't know it was wrong. I didn't know it was wrong. And then you can justify by saying, well, parents never taught me that. Just kidding. When we are tempted, we entertain a desire and we think of the benefits of of that sin. After we commit the sin, Satan wants us to feel so guilty that we hide from God. He tells us that it is okay to sin and it is not a big deal. But then once we sin, he puts the thoughts in our head like, how is God going to love me now? I messed up. God is going to be so upset with me. How can he forgive me? Satan wants nothing more for us to alienate ourselves from God. He wants those thoughts to cause us to flee. When we realize that God is on our side, he, we can overcome any temptation. Which leads me to my third point. We can be victorious over temptation by trusting God and following his instructions in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 6-13 Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and they were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us and on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God is rooting for us to be victorious. He will provide a way of escape every time we are tempted. We must be watching for the escape route and ready to go. You know, when I first started with Metro Transit, we had these old man buses, which are pretty much ready to be retired and and out the door. They were pretty old and in pretty rough shape. But some of the buses, and I hope this doesn't gross you out, but some of the buses had cockroaches on them because they were old and, like I said, being ready to go. The thing about cockroaches is they love the dark. When lights are out, they come out to play. They search for food. They continue to grow and multiply. Right? And the minute you turn on the light, they would scatter and go to their hiding spots. And we had a thing that when you turn on the light and they were up in the front of the bus, you knew it was bad. So then you called the exterminator and they would come out, which we had to call them a lot on those buses. But when you turned on the light, they would scatter and go to their hiding spots. They couldn't stand the light and they knew 
They, they couldn't do what they did in the, in the dark because the light exposes them. So they went and hid. Sin is like a cockroach. It loves the dark, thrives in the dark, grows in the dark, multiplies in the dark. How often do we hide our sin in the dark, allowing it to not only destroy us, but to destroy the relationships around us? All because we are worried about what God or other people will think. The longer that we allow temptation to linger, the easier it is to rationalize and to get pulled in. We need to expose our temptations and our sin to the sunlight, S-O-N light. We need to expose our sins to the light of Jesus. When we expose it to the light, we disable the temptation and the battle is already half won. God is faithful and he has given us the tools to be victorious over temptation. He has given us his word to help guide us and give us wisdom. He has given us the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. He has given us each other to help each other and to hold each other accountable. He is with us every step of the way. I have found that when I give into temptation and sin, it is not because God was not there. It was because I was not with God. I was doing my own thing, and my eyes were fixed on the worldly things. To resist temptation, we must rely on God's strength. Ephesians 10, uh, 6, 10 through 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Are we putting on the full armor of God each and every day? Or are we only putting on pieces that we want to and only on the days that we want? He is telling us that if we have the full armor on, we are able to stand up and against Satan and his temptation. This is where discipline and a plan comes in. If we know that temptation is all around us, then we need to discipline ourselves to not take it lightly and to put on the full armor each and every day. It comes down to our decision on how important God is in our lives. If he is number one priority in our lives, then we're going to put the extra energy to make sure that we have the full armor on. We're going to make sure that we are focused and on the lookout for Satan's temptations. But if he is anywhere but number one, then we're less likely to put the armor on. And before you know it, we're not paying attention, and Satan is loving it. We also need to have a, have a plan on how we're going to start each day and how we're going to stay focused. How are we going to make sure that we're putting on the full armor of God? Do you have notes in the bathroom mirror reminding you? How about an alarm that goes off before you leave the house that says, hey, are you focused on Jesus? How are we going to make sure that we stay focused each and every day? What is the plan? What can we do to put reminders in the mornings and throughout the day to help us to stay focused? What is your plan? Do you have an accountability partner? It is important for us to have someone that can hold us accountable and vice versa. Someone that we can call and say, hey, I'm struggling right now. Can you pray for me? Can, can you, I, I just need someone to talk to. Do you have someone that you can talk to? I can hold you accountable. Lastly, Jesus paid for all our sin in, in advance. We can rest in God's free grace and walk in new life. Romans 5, 1 through 10. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has get, been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, ha having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Temptation is really a subversion of God's grace. Before we sin, the enemy says, don't worry about it. God's grace will forgive you. 
after we sin, the enemy says, oh boy, do I have bad news for you now. God's grace won't cover that sin. Satan wants us to think that God will not forgive you or love you, but that is not true. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that for a moment. The creator of the universe loved us so much that while we were still sinners, while we were choosing the worldly things over him, he sent his son to die for us. He sent his son to pay the price that should have been my, my price, which was death. I didn't earn his love. I don't deserve his love. Yet he gave himself away. You know, I didn't ask ahead of time, so I apologize. But would the elders and, and pastors sort of raise your hand? I won't make you stand up, but just raise your hand. And if you just kind of look around, just notice the, these people. And we have a few missing. But I want you to know that there are people around you that are there for you, that are praying for you, even when you don't know it, that are loving you, that want to come alongside of you. They want to help, encourage, and pray for each of you. You don't need to feel like you're alone because you're not. And you don't need to feel like you're the only one that sins because we're all sinners. And sin is sin. There is no scale of your sins. There's no worse than mine. Lawrence is not worse than mine. And mine is not worse than Lawrence. They're the same. Sin is sin. There's no scale for our sins. All of our sin is the same. It's all bad, and it all leads to death. If you are here this morning and you're struggling with temptation, or you feel like you're losing the battle with temptation, don't leave here without talking to one of our pastors or elders. Don't go through it alone. Shine the light on it and stand strong relying on God's strength. If you're here this morning and you're struggling with sin, you can't seem to break the cycle. You can't seem to resist the temptation. Seek out a pastor or elder and let us help you. Let us pray for you. Let us shine the light of Jesus on it. And if you have not given your life to Jesus, don't wait any longer. Seek a pastor or elder. And they love to talk to you about surrendering your life to Jesus and about being baptized. God loves you right where you are, but he doesn't want you to stay in that sin. I love that quote from Max Licato. God loves you right where you are, but he doesn't want you to stay there. He doesn't want us to keep going round and round with the same sin and temptation. He doesn't want us to continue to fall for Satan's lies. He wants us to stand firm and stand strong in faith. There is nothing in this world that is worth our souls. I'd like to close out the message with a verse from Romans. And as I read this verse, I want you to think about your walk with Jesus and where you are at. God wants to use you to bring the light into this dark world. There are people all around us that are hurting, and they need to hear the message of Jesus. But we cannot share the light if we are living in the darkness. We need to say no to Satan's lies and say yes to Jesus each and every time we're tempted. Once we choose Jesus, the old is gone, and we need to stay living with Jesus, not focused on our past, not living with what we did, not living in our old sin. We need to live our lives focused on Jesus and following him. Romans 6, 1 through 5, the message version, reads this. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it is like the burial of Jesus. When we are raised up out of the water, it is like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world, by our Father, so that we can see where we're going in our new grace, sovereign country. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, temptation is all around us. Every day, every day we battle temptation, and at times we lose the battle. But I pray for strength to keep fighting and to keep our eyes focused on Jesus so that we may defeat it.
Father, I pray that we do not take temptations lightly. I pray that we will be ready each and every day to face it. I pray for discipline, that every day we wake up and before we head out the door to school, to work, grocery shopping, wherever we go, whatever we're doing, we will put on the full armor of God. We will be focused and on the lookout for Satan's lies. And when we are tempted, I pray that we are looking for the way out that you provide for us and the strength to say no. No matter how desirable, alluring, appealing, tantalizing, or inviting the sin may be, we must not give in to it. Father, you breathe life into each and every one of us, and you love us all. I pray that we all make you our number one priority in our lives each and every day. I pray that we will stand strong in faith and that we will say no to the temptation. I pray that we will stand side by side with each other, helping one another, praying for one another, and holding each other accountable. We are all sinners, and we are all in need of your grace. May we live each and every day focused, prepared, wearing the full armor, ready to say no to Satan, and may we show your love and hope to others. May we shine our light of Jesus on the darkness. In your name we pray. Amen.